Today we're going to talk about BitMessage. BitMessage is a uh, encrypted networking protocol and client. Specifically, we're going to go through what is BitMessage, how does it work, what are the benefits, and what are the downsides. What is BitMessage? BitMessage is a communication protocol that allows you to communicate with another person or many subscribers securely and anonymously. Messages are encrypted without user interaction, so you don't have to use another third-party software suite or you don't have to use any plugins or add-ons to uh, handle the encryption for you. BitMessage aims to hide non-content data like the sender and receiver of messages. This is helping uh, you know, keep you anonymous on the network so that anyone on the network can't tell exactly who and where uh, the messages are being sent from or sent to. Um, BitMessage is decentralized. No central server that can be taken down or hacked. There's no centralized area that could be monitored or blocked or you know, disconnected in any fashion. BitMessage uses a peer-to-peer -peer networking topology. The connections are removed for faster reconnection types of communications possible, person-to-person -person messages, broadcasts, mailing lists, others, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Currently, the protocol is only implemented by a standalone application available at the BitMessage website. How does it work? We're going to talk about standard and deterministic addresses, encryption and proof of work, network communication, messages and broadcasts. How does it work? Addresses. BitMessage does not use plain text addresses. Each address uses a format such as this, and you might recognize this type of address if you ever used um, Bitcoin since it uses a very similar address mechanism. These addresses include information that allow other clients to communicate with your client in order to send secure messages. Essentially, in your address, it contains all the information needed for another client to contact you and send you messages. You are not limited to one address. Multiple addresses can be generated and used. Uh, you can generate as many addresses as you would like, and they all continue to function. There is even the ability to generate an address off of a passphrase, allowing you to regenerate the same address in your location. This is handy if you've lost your computer, file corruption, or you're just somewhere else that you would like to send a message from your address and this allows you to regenerate the exact same address and use it as normal. How does it work? Encryption and proof of work. One of the nicest things about BitMessage is that it encrypts all of its messages without the user having to do anything. The use of additional encryption is up to the user. Messages are encrypted with the ECDSA, just like Bitcoin. Messages are encrypted with the recipient's public key, just like any public key, private key method. If I'm sending you a message, I use your public key to encrypt the message. And if you're sending me back a message, you use my public keys to send me the message. Uh, now, when we both decrypt the message, we use our own respective private keys. To prevent flooding, your client must compute a proof of work. The proof of work is similar to also what's on, used on the Bitcoin network. Uh, it's essentially, it makes your computer do a lot of math before it can send anything. This limits the number of messages your computer can send in a given amount of time. The proof of work uses a double round of SHA-512 encryption. Uh, and this is basically generates a checksum that is easily checkable and uh, only valid messages with a, a with a sufficient proof of work will be sent out through the network. Uh, if your message does not have appropriate proof of work, it will not propagate. For more details about proof of work, visit the wiki page. How does it work? Network. The message is loosely based off of the network functionality of Bitcoin. Instead of sending currency, messages are sent between the clients. BitMessage does not use a blockchain like Bitcoin does. Instead, it saves the last two and a half days, and that's what it relays throughout the network. When you receive a new message, it triggers an acknowledgement to be sent to the sender of the message, letting them know that you successfully received the message. If they do not receive an uh, acknowledgement, they will resend the message in two days, and then it's an exponentially decreasing amount of time, so they'll send it in two days, four days, and 16 days, and so on. Um, this way, if, you're, uh, if your client's not online for two and a half days, when you join, you will not download any of the messages that you missed, but you will download one of the new generated messages. Public keys are requested if not already known. Uh, public keys are part of what's stored on the network, so you do not have to be online necessarily to um, send someone a message, or they do not have to be online for you to be able to send them a message. Peer-to-peer -peer networking is used to connect BitMessage clients. This, like we said before, is a lot better than using a centralized setup. And then you can connect to the BitMessage network using Tor or Sox proxies. Tor is an anonymous proxy service. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you definitely check it out. Clients that allow open ports help expand the network. If you have incoming connections, you, then others are able to directly connect to you. Whereas if you are running through a firewall or a NAT, then you are able to uh, still connect to the network. You just have all outgoing connections only. Uh, now you are still connected to uh, nodes that do allow incoming connections, so you are still expanding the network, you're still helping it out, but it helps even more to have incoming connections. The network gets your sent messages not knowing if it originated from your client, since all clients relay all messages. 
uh, essentially this is saying that you know just because I've uh, forwarded a message to a node that I'm connected to that node doesn't know if I originated the message or if I'm just forwarding it for someone else since it looks exactly the same uh, the ability to have receivers completely hidden is a definite feature of the BitMessage protocol. Um, since when you receive a message, you should continue to forward it to others. Uh, your client looks no different on the network than every other node that doesn't necessarily have uh, received the message. Maximum message size is 180 megabytes, but the proof of work for this would be very large. As the message size goes up, the proof of work goes up with it, since it's having to do proof of work based on the message. So doing a 180 megabyte proof of work would take a very, very long time. Here's what a typical peer-to-peer -peer networking topology looks like. As you can see, there are multiple paths between all of the clients, uh, but not necessarily all of the clients are connected to all of the other clients. You are only connected to a handful of clients, and then they in turn are connected to another handful of clients. And with BitMessage, if you're allowing incoming connections, you typically will have 50, 100 or more connections at a time. If you are only using outgoing connections, that's limited to, limited to about 8 connections. Here's what a typical client-server networking topology looks like. As you can see, if something happens and the server loses connection, loses power, and is shut down, none of the clients will be able to communicate with each other. The network status tab of BitMessage looks like this. Uh, it shows you the total number of connections, and if you look on the bottom right-hand corner, you will see the connection indicator. If the indicator is yellow, that means that you are connected to the network, but you have only outgoing connections. If it's green, that means that you are port forwarding, you're not behind a firewall, and you are allowing incoming connections. If it is red, then you are not connected to the network at all. You will see the stream number. Basically, this is a mitigation technique to prevent um, excessive bandwidth and disk space needed in the future with the future expansion and growth. Uh, when the network grows to a certain point in time, it will automatically break off into new streams. Um, these new streams, you only relay the information within those streams. Um, you can be connected to the multiple streams, and if you send a message to someone else on another stream, you connect to their stream, and then you send a message. So BitMessage continues to function just like normal it makes no difference this just really helps cut down on the bandwidth and the disk space needed uh, you also see that it shows the startup time of the client and shows the total number of process messages and public keys messages and broadcasts these are the two um, top most common used communication techniques with bitmessage messages are sent from one individual to another or person to person they use the described encryption methods and are the heart of bitmessage Broadcasts. Um, broadcasts have one sender and many recipients. You can think of like a radio station has one transmitting tower and many listeners. Due to the nature of BitMessage, this is a built-in feature. Since every client gets every message, it makes it very easy to send one message out to multiple recipients. Um, anyone can send a broadcast from any of their addresses. You just designate it when you're sending the message. Broadcasts are encrypted with the sender's public key currently. Um, what this is saying is instead of if I'm sending you a message, I would encrypt with your public key, but if I'm sending a broadcast, I would send it out with my public key. And this allows anyone to subscribe to your address, and only subscribers will see these messages. Um, and it, they are encrypted as they're sent, but anyone can subscribe to it. So be careful with what kind of content you send out using this. A couple other message types using BitMessage. Mailing lists, also known as pseudo mailing lists. They receive person-to-person -person messages and send them out as broadcasts. Any address can be set to function as a mailing list, and it requires the client to be running for the mailing list to be online. Basically, you send it a direct message, and it rebroadcasts it out um, from the same address. So you have to be subscribed to it. Anyone can subscribe to it. Um, but there is a level of moderation, since it's all done and handled by one client. Um, you can blacklist, whitelist, and do other few things for moderation. Chans, on the other hand, chans are created by users having the same address and sending broadcast messages. Uh, the identical addresses are generated by using simple text as a common passkey. So like I mentioned before, how you can recover your address using a passkey. With this, basically, you choose a common simple passkey and you distribute that among all the users. They all generate the exact same address and they all subscribe to that address. And then you can send out broadcasts and uh, there's no tell who the sender was since there's no identification even in a bit message address uh, tied with the person. Uh, this makes uh, communication a lot more anonymous since everyone has the same identity. But if you would like to sign a message or you would like to communicate with the Chan um, you know, and verify who you are, you could just send it a person to person message and this allows you to sign it with your signature. A couple of benefits to using BitMessage. It's easy to use, the encryption is built in, secure, anonymous, and safe. You receive an acknowledgement of the delivery. Cannot be censored, moderated, or controlled as a whole. Like I said, there are moderations available on small and individual levels, but um, there's no central server to shut down. There's no central port to block. 
there's nothing that could be used to control the message as a whole. Uh, it offers a solid base for other functions to be built upon. Um, you could build a Twitter client, social networking client, social media clients, uh, etc. Uh, a few of these are already underway, being developed, but really essentially you could build anything on top of BitMessage using it as the communication protocol. A couple downsides to using BitMessage. It currently requires you to run it as an application on a computer. Um, obviously computing proof of work on a mobile phone is going to take some time. So we're going to have to figure out a way to do that easily. Um, so currently a PC computer based option is, is the best. Uh, addresses are non-readable which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, you know, you, Instead of using your name or your screen name or whatever you would like to use as your address as plain text, um, you're using these long characters. And the nice thing about that is it doesn't tie you down to one specific address so it's very easy for you to move from one to the other. Um, it, obviously the downside is it's harder to remember. It uses more disk space and bandwidth than a client and server topology would. Um, with a client and server it only needs one copy on the server and then all the clients pull from that one copy. And with the peer-to-peer -peer networking style every client has a copy of everything so obviously that's going to use more disk space and more bandwidth to transmit it. BitMessage is not attachment friendly like we said with the 180 megabyte limit and the proof of work time that it takes to send a large message. Um, However, you could use BitMessage to send a passkey, login, whatever you need to be able to send a large file via other means. And BitMessage is not hardened or fully tested yet. There are no uh, professional reviews, there's no professional involvement. Um, there's been a lot of work, a lot of code, a lot of eyes on the code, but um, nothing professional yet. And that's it for the presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it, and maybe we'll do another one on how to set up and use BitMessage in the future. Thanks.